that you are in this place. We have come together here, Lord, and, and you promised that whenever we're together in your name, you're here in the midst. And we just praise you, Lord, that you have given us your word. And Lord, we pray that we will receive it as fresh breath today. In Jesus' name, amen. How's your vision today? How's your vision? How about if you took off your glasses? Oh, I'm totally blind. <laughs> Can anybody remember Mr. Magoo? Yeah. For people who aren't old enough to know who Mr. Magoo was, he would leave his glasses home. And he'd just wander around and he'd walk over open holes and as he would walk over an open hole, a board would suddenly be shoved in there and he'd walk across it. And he had no idea that he was ever in danger. He up a telephone pole and had a light yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did. So I see us, the Lord was showing me that we're kind of like Mr. Magoo. And we walk along and the Lord does that for us and we don't see it. We don't see it. We walk through life blindly and don't see how God has provided for us again and again. Then, when we try to go forward, all we can see is the dangers and hazards, and we don't dare trust that God will be there along the way. And by the way, your note sheet will be quite helpful for you this morning. And there's little pens in the back of the seats in case you wanted to write anything down there. So if you need a bulletin, now would be the time to grab one. <clears throat> Today, because of that situation that we don't always see what God's doing, I think we all need to get our vision corrected. Not necessarily our natural vision, because we've gone to the eye doctor for that. But definitely our spiritual vision. Tell your neighbor, it's time to get your vision corrected. And somebody can sure they point at me too because I need that. I need my spiritual vision corrected just as much as anyone. Today we're going to primarily be looking at the book of Philippians. And we can take some lessons from the Apostle Paul who experienced real blindness after his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He truly had his vision corrected miraculously and looked forward with joy. And isn't that what we want to do? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, in order to get your vision corrected, you need an eye exam. Who has been to the eye doctor and had an eye exam before? Every single person in the room. I think the Lord knew that. I have to tell you before and get into this. I was so excited when the Lord was giving me this message. He's just given it to me. And it's one of those things. He kind of gave it to me line by line. And it was awesome. So all these things, are. if, if I get excited, it's because I'm getting confirmation of what the Lord gave me in my house. All right. This particular eye exam is in three parts. You don't need drops or that uncomfortable <laughs> walk home <laughs> test. I hate that so much. I always flinch. <laughs> Number one. Here's the first part of your exam. And this is spiritual vision, of course. What is sufficient for you? What is sufficient for you? Well, here's my little props. We're going to pretend that uh, we're going to a local restaurant, and they have on the menu that um, they have an eight-ounce glass of juice for two dollars. It seems expensive, but you know, an eight-ounce glass of juice is a good amount of juice. And all you need to do, you bring your own glass. And you can have your glass of juice. So you go in and you bring a glass. <laughs> You're looking for a glass of juice. And you ask for the juice 
and the waitress brings out a glass of juice. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it would be enough. This is, by the way, eight ounces of juice, for real. Sometimes we're like that. We bring a big old vessel to God, and we're looking. He says, I have eight ounces. It's exactly what you need. And you say, I wanted my cup full. And the Lord's saying, I'm sufficient for you. I, have, I know what you need, and I've given you what you need. What Paul says, he says, I have everything I need and more than enough. I am taken care of because Epaphroditus brought your gift. It is a sweet gift. It's a gift that costs you something. And it's the kind of gift God is so pleased with. And my God will give you everything you need because of his great riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. And in here, there is that Jehovah Jireh. So I'm going in my head. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Amen. He will have his angels watch over me. Yes. <laughs> and it, 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 you can see me just sitting there. In our society, we have been trained to believe that we need way more in order to survive. It's hard when we look at the tremendous wealth of others around us not to feel like we're missing out. What did we do wrong, God, for you not to bless me? People around us curse God and look at what they get and look what I got. We look at the glass as more than half empty instead of being full of what God has already given us. Paul says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, this is one of my favorite, very favorite Bible verses, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. And in case you didn't get it, this is plainer English. I know how to get along with little and how to live when I have much. I have learned the secret of being happy at all times. If I am full of food and have all I need, I am happy. If I am hungry and need more, I am happy. I can do all things because Christ gives me the strength. Amen. Back to our vision test. If we always see God as falling short, if we always see that glass as half empty or less, how can we trust him in the future? We need to look and see how God has provided for us in the past and how he provides for us, provides for me today. Um, I also have a whole list of health issues. I won't bore you with them because mostly I just ignore them. I don't have time to deal with it. I'm sure Denise would understand exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Well, the other day, I got sick. I went to urgent care a couple of times. Then we went to the ER for about, I don't know, three or four hours. And I went in and I said to the doctor, I want you to tell me that I'm all right. And after a whole bunch of tests, the doctor came back and said, you're all right. I said, okay, I'm going home. And that's what I did. But when I woke up the next day, I thought, wow, God, you have blessed me so much with good health. Amen. I wasn't looking at all of these 
other things, it just hit me. You're awesome, God. You have blessed me with good health. Now, there has to be something that God has blessed you with. That right this minute, I want you, we're going to practice here. You're going to turn right now and tell your neighbor one thing that God has provided for you today. One thing. What has he given you? I'm serious. You need to tell your neighbor. Don't tell me. All right. Did y'all find something to share? That was the first part of the test. Now we go into the next cubicle. How do you see history? We we're talking about how we're seeing whether God provides for us or not. Now, now we're looking at how do you see history, your history? There is something spoken of these days called revisionist history. You ever heard that term? Yes. According to Wikipedia, this is the online experts on everything. Revisionist history is the reinterpretation of orthodox views on evidence, motivations, and decision-making processes surrounding an historical event. In plain English, it is when we look back at things that happened in the past and come up with our own ideas about why it happened and what motivated the people. Even though every other rational person sees the evidence one way, we look at it from a totally different perspective. And we do that. Here's an example. Campaign ads. Mm. Anybody enjoying them right now? No. No? <laughs> Don't they drive me nuts this time of year. Can you imagine if the candidates were really as bad as the ads made them appear? Or, and how about this, if you think New York ads are bad, try living in a swing state like North Carolina. It's horrible. By the time the election day comes, it's impossible to know what is right or wrong. We just want it to be over with. The, the political action committees and some of the candidates interpret history to bring fear, suspicion, and mistrust of their opponent. They make their opponent look evil and greedy and power hungry. They're trying to manipulate the voters into believing their candidate is going to save them from the evil candidate that is really out to get them. Jerry and I talk about how we would just like to hear the truth and what the candidates really believe and think. It'd be nice if this was just a political thing, but it also happens in our personal lives. We need to be careful how we interpret our history, or we can be carried away by suspicion and fear. Yep. It's possible to look back and see people the way the negative political ads view opposing candidates. We can look at our own past and see people with evil motives, that they were out to get us. And they did all these things because they really don't like us. We end up being on the defensive. Always trying to protect ourselves from these attacks that are around us. Revisionist history causes us, uh, when our, our personal revisionist history causes us to do one of two things. First, we don't look forward at all. We're always watching behind us to try to protect ourselves from what might happen. Or we use the phrase, the best defense is a good offense, and we figure out a way to strike back. Living by the warped version of the golden rule, do unto others before they do unto you. <laughs> 
When we find ourselves under attack, God has a better way. Amen. God has provided us with spiritual armor, and we're going to look at it quickly. Loin skirted with truth. Do you have a little picture? Cute little guy in here. Loin skirted with truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shield of faith. Helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit. It's called the full or the whole armor of God. Did you notice something's missing? Right. Um, salvation. No, it's all there. What's on his back? What's on his back? Nothing. 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 And the reason that there is no armor on the back is that God had your back all what Paul says. Not that I, but I have already reached the start again. Not that I have already reached oh there it is. My little guy moved over and it skipped some words. Reached the goal or I'm already fully mature but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. So how do you apply that? Well, I'll give you a little testimony. About 20 years ago, one day in prayer, and I can tell you exactly where I was. I was in apartment B3 in Parrish. Mike would know because that was his apartment, and I was probably trying to get it ready for Mike's family to move in. 20 years ago, God spoke to my heart. He said it was up to me. I could keep trying to defend myself against all attacks that I saw coming from people as individual battles on my own, one at a time. Or I had to trust him with all of it. Amen. All of it. One way or the other. God was not going to help me defend myself. I had to let him defend me or I was on my own to have to go out and correct any rumors. And there were rumors flying around at that time. Yep. Any attacks, I would have had to go and talk. It was overwhelming. There was no way that I could stop what people were thinking or saying or any of that. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they're... I can guess what their motives were. I can guess what was going on. And, but God said, doesn't matter. It's up to you. You choose. I'm going to fight your battles or you're going to fight your battles. I said, you fight my battles. Amen. The attacks didn't stop, but I didn't care. Amen. I didn't care. I didn't have to fight because God had my back. Some things that have been said for me or about me for years have been true. Some have been lies. But you know what? I've probably done just as bad to other people. We all have. We have to decide, though, when we're feeling like we're under attack. And when we look back at our past and see that history, are we looking back and then not going forward because we're trying to figure out how we're going to defend ourselves against the next attack coming. It keeps us stuck. Yes. When I chose to let God do it, the attacks didn't stop, but they didn't hurt me anymore. 
and I had peace, and I had joy. Amen. And you know what? I'm not that special. What he does for me, he'll do for you. Amen. And there is so much scripture that we can hold on to with that. If God is for us, who can be against us? Picture this. Us standing there with our little armor. I, I picked a little kid looking guy. Just kind of helpless. We're standing there. God has our back. Can you imagine? Let the attacks come because you know what? God has my back. He has your back if you want to let him. Or you can fight your own battles. It's up to you. My thinking is don't waste your time and energy dwelling in the dark shadows of the past. Look at where you are today. Who brought you through? Believe you me, it wasn't your efforts or you'd be worse off. Amen. It was God who has your back. Amen. Okay, practice time. If you can think of a time that you got through a tough time, raise your hand and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now look at your neighbor and tell him or her, God has my back. God has my back. Next part of the test. Y'all ready for this? You like this? Wait, there's a two part test? Is the multiple It's a three part test. We've done two. Yeah. Vision. Three parts. <laughs> this one's coming up. This one. How do you see past your sin? Now you need to pay attention to what I'm saying here. How do you see... I didn't say how do you see your past sin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is how do you see past your sin? Got it? There's a commercial on TV about being nose blind. What? You know the commercial? Millions of people suffer from nose blindness. The silent condition occurs when you get used to the odors around you and no longer smell them while your guests still can. <laughs> we can easily imagine the horror of having someone come into our house and smell a stanky thing that we have lived with for years. <laughs> the commercial is to sell us something that covers the stank. Yeah. <laughs> well, here we are in the middle of the world, and it stinks of sin. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when we played in it, mm -hmm. rolled in it, and stank like it. Every now and then, someone might have come along and offered to spray a little religion over us so we wouldn't stink so bad. And we might have tried it a bit, but we still stink. Pastor Scott, did you stink of sin? Yes. Harriet? Yes. Yes. Denise? I am. Yes. I, am. I didn't smell it until Jesus showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord, and I really stank of sin. But praise the Lord, and Jesus rescued me out of the stinky, sin-infested world. He washed me clean with his very own blood and forgave all my sins. Every single one. And immediately, at that very moment, I became holy and blameless before God Almighty. How wonderful it would have been if I was instantly transported bodily into heaven and didn't have to be in the stinky world another moment. But that was not God's plan. Amen. Jesus told his disciples, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Amen. These things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Bonnie, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. And this is what Jesus prayed for them. Prayed for his disciples. It says in his last prayer for them, he said, But now I come to you. And he's talking to the Lord. And he says, In these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And God answered Jesus' prayer. And here we are in the world. For as long as we live in the world, we will be surrounded by stinking sin. But as people who are sanctified by the forgiving blood of Jesus, those who are His, we are different than those who belong to the world. And stinking sin doesn't have a hold on us ever anymore. Amen. Ever. Amen. Amen. Paul tells us in Ephesians, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. Raise your hand. You did. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. Amen. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God, ooh, I love this one. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us is shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Yay. This is, um, I've been here several times this summer, and I think Pastor Scott has included this in every single message, so I felt like I needed to put this in. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Yep. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spirit spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Here's a question. Does God see you as sin covered and stinking of the world? No. 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 He sees his completed, finished masterpiece when he sees you. Perfect, holy, righteous, without blame, in the likeness and image of his son. This is how some people see it. It's not how I see it, but this is how some people see it. That when God looks at a Christian, he sees Jesus. Kind of like the, the person is hiding behind Jesus. And if they slip, Jesus no longer blocks his view. And God sees that person as filthy, like they were before. They look quick for a can of religion to spray on themselves to be more acceptable to God. It's not how I see it. When God 
sees you. He sees you as the finished work. He gets the glory because of the huge transformation that he has made in you by the work of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And by the work of the Holy Spirit. So even though I'm in the midst of a cesspool of a world of sin, I don't stink. I'm not rotten. And if you have trusted Jesus to forgive you of your sins, he looks at you that way too. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. The, the, I, don't know, I don't know how to demonstrate this. It's, it's in my head, and if I could give it to you out of my head, I would. There, there's a reason that we have trouble believing that. And it's because we live in time. Our life is on a timeline. And if you could picture it as a tiny little marble sitting right here on this podium, that's our life would be like a speck on that marble. And we go by day by day and we walk in sin and we have all these difficulties and we know that. And we think that's it because that's our perspective. God does not live in time. God lives in eternity, the size of this room, or bigger. So when God sees, he's not seeing this little bitty pit, bit of timeline that is Sunday, September 23rd, if that's the date, that we're in right now. God sees the whole thing. He sees that marble beginning and end. He sees the whole thing. He sees you finished. He sees you finished. Just how when you're going to stand before him in heaven, that's what he sees today. He sees that today. It's an eternal thing. It's not about what you do every moment. And we can be blinded by how we see our sin. And we can't see past our sin does that make sense? Did I make sense there? Yeah. Eventually, and, and we know, if, if you look at Scripture, where are we right now? Heavenly places, you know, seated in heavenly places. We know that. We've been taught that. Eventually, our bodies gonna, are going to catch up, and we'll be there face to face. But to God, who lives in eternity... We're already there. We are already there. And God sees us like as we will be when we see him face to face. So, what happens when we sin? Same thing is when we walk through something the dog left behind. Mm. We wash off our shoe and we keep going forward. We don't stand and look back and say, I'm filthy and good for nothing now. God can't ever love me because I'm such a mess, so I might as well roll in it and stay filthy. Oh. No. no. We don't do that. But that's exactly what happens if we're blinded by that past sin. We look at where we were, even if it was two minutes ago, and we are blinded to the incredible work of the cross. Amen. Jesus tells us who? Jesus tells us to keep the... Not, Jesus never tells us to keep the law and be perfect in the world. He gave us two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. That should keep us plenty busy so we don't have time to sin. But if you do or I do... Kick the dust off your feet and face forward. Amen. Time to practice. This part of the test, it's time to take a look at yourself. So just close your eyes for a second. Look at who you were. Now look at who you are in Christ. It is a true miracle. What has been done in your life? Amen. Amen. Now your vision test 
is complete. <laughs> Got through that. And now you can see some things clear, but it doesn't do you any good to have your vision corrected in the examining room if you can't take it with you. Can you imagine carrying that big old thing wherever you go? <laughs> Just like I need eyeglasses to be able to see as clearly right now as I did in the examining room, I need a prescription, boy do I need a prescription, to see the way forward and to experience joy in my life. And we can thank God for the Apostle Paul. Oh, yes. He gives us such a testimony of God's work in the life of a wretched man. He was a murderer. He was the most religious hypocrite that probably ever walked the planet. And look at what God did to transform his life. And because of that, we can trust that Paul's instruction will be true. So we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at Philippians 3. And remember in verse 13 and 14, Paul tells us he is forgetting what lies behind and reaching, pressing toward, pressing forward toward what lies ahead. He continues on in Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. In Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly with, wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of power that he has, even to, the sub, even to subject all things to himself. Paul is pointing his eyes forward. In history, Paul had nothing to look forward to but an execution. But he is looking forward. He is looking for a spiritual walk. He is look, looking forward to that prize. Whether he was going to see it in that prison cell or whether he was going to see it with the Lord, he is going forward and he is forgetting what is behind and he is going forward. Amen. And that's where he is when you look at Philippians 4.4. 4. And we're going to walk through that slowly because this is the prescription for how we can day to day face forward and not be blinded by our past. We can have a vision moving forward. Amen. Amen. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He's provided everything you need. We practice that. You're alive today. You're breathing. He is Praise the Lord. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. He is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Rejoice in Him. Yeah. Amen. And Philippians 4, 5. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. I thought about that for a second. I'm not very gentle. But I can be because you know what? God has my back. Yeah. God has my back. I can be gentle. I don't have to fight. I can be gentle because God has my back. Amen. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing. And you can read the rest of that on your own. But know that God is your provider and you will have his peace that will guard your heart and mind. If you always know that God is going to take care of you, you will always have peace. Amen. And it, it, you can ask him. If you don't have peace, you ask it. Lord, I need help in this. Thank you that you're going to take care of me. And you find your peace comes back. It's an awesome thing. And then the rest is found in Philippians 4, 8. And he says, dwell on these things. 
If you want to know where to look to find joy in this world, this is how to do it. You focus your vision your physical vision and spiritual vision on these things. And the way Paul put it, he said, dwell on these things. When you dwell on something, if you put a, as much effort into worrying about, uh, dwelling on things as you would worrying, put that kind of effort on these things. You know how you can really focus on things if you want to worry? You can focus on things with that intensity on these list of things that are found here in Philippians. Dwell on these things. Whatever is true. Whatever is true. Dwell on that. You know, it isn't your job to correct every lie. Just focus on the truth. If you can't see truth in the situation, just focus on Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And that'll be sufficient. Dwell on these things. Whatever is honorable. Webster says honorable means entitled to honor or respect. Dwell on those things. Don't waste your effort on raising up dishonorable things. Dwell on these things. Whatever is right, sometimes it's hard to know what exactly is right. But this is what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Dwell on these things. Whatever is pure. God says in Psalms 24, 3 through 4, Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. Here's something to keep in mind. You are entitled to have a clean place. You're entitled to that. It may not be rich and fancy, but you can make it clean. Amen. Even if it is a corner of your room, let that place be free of idols and where you meet with God with honesty for a few moments. Dwell on what is pure. That can be your pure place when you are in that clean place and honest with the Lord. Dwell on these things. Whatever is lovely, open your eyes and look around. God didn't need to make the earth beautiful. He didn't need to create rainbows and sunsets and flowers and perfectly formed snowflakes. He didn't need to create the twinkle in your children's eyes. Dwell on these things, whatever is of good report or admirable. This makes me think of something we can learn from people in recovery. We need to be careful of these three things, people, places, and things. If they have a lousy reputation, you're looking for trouble. We should be looking for things that we can appreciate for their good reputation. Look for them. Dwell on these things. If there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, sometimes you may have to search. When we're standing in the middle of a trial, or a mess of our own making, or circumstances of life that came our way, it may take some effort to find something worthy of praise. But God's handiwork is always excellent. And if you can see Him, see His handiwork, and focus on that, dwell on that. Dwell on these things, Paul says. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Boy, that 
is so simple. I'll tell you what, you know the Lord doesn't make things complicated. Today I've covered a lot. So we're going to do a quick recap. First, the exam. Number one, what is sufficient for you? How has God provided for you? Keep that in your mind. What is your history really like? How has God had your back? Amen. Can you see past your sin? How has God transformed you by the cross of Jesus Christ? Paul trusted God. He knew that God provided for him. He knew God had his back. He knew God transformed him. It was without question. He didn't have to remember the past. It was settled. Just like any of us, though, Paul knew it was impossible to forget the past by focusing on forgetting. Try this. Forget this glance. Look at it really closely. Focus hard on it. Forget it. Don't remember this glance. It doesn't work. When we are focused on the past, we can't forget about it. Amen. And still be able to reach forward on what lies ahead. If you do that, you will only be discouraged and grow weary and paralyzed by fear and doubt. Amen. Amen. Paul knew that the way to let go of what is behind is to focus on better things. That is why he gave us those instructions, that list of things. He said, if we practice those things, dwell on those things, that the God of peace will be with us. I believe him, do you? Yes. When we've been looking at that stuff today, has it increased your joy? Yes. Has it increased your peace? Amen. Well, we're going to pray right now. And God wants me to have you pray a little differently today than we normally do. So I want you to kind of group up and find some people that you're going to pray with. It won't hurt you, I promise. I'm not going to make you pray for them or anything like that. But you're going to get in a group. On your feet, if you're able. Be in a group, you're going to pray. You need to be able to see each other's faces. 